sing all those mournful songs. Well, I, the first one I was asked, that just sort of caught me off guard. I never considered them mournful at all. Because the truth is revealed in the Word of God that, uh, you know, we're not going to live here forever. And one of these days, this life is going to be over. And the older we get, the closer that end becomes. So what happens after that? The promises of the Scripture are tremendous. Paul, having personal experience because he was caught up to what he described as the third heaven, which means all the way there. And he heard things that wasn't lawful to speak. So marvelous was it, the things that he heard and experienced there, that language simply could not describe the joy and the happiness of what he experienced in paradise. That is what moved him to say, to die is gain, to go on to be with the Lord is far better. It was such a pleasing theme that when the thief on the day that the Lord was crucified, the one on the right hand, and when he asked the Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom, the Lord Jesus Christ simply said to him, today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. That word paradise is a beautiful descriptor. Because it speaks of a magnificent garden. It created a picture in that man's mind of a lovely garden. Peaceful and quiet and lovely. A place without stress. A place without worry. A place without anxiety. One of the amazing things is that after the Lord told that uh, man that... that you never heard another word from him. It seems that the message of grace, that today thou shalt be with me in paradise, was such a lovely message to him that he was in perfect peace with what was about to happen to him. This morning, the Lord willing, I'd like to continue in our subject concerning the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven as it's described, or the kingdom of I'd like to read two, uh, uh, a case, two uh, parables that's found in Matthew chapter 13, beginning at verse number 44. First is the parable of the hidden treasure, and then the parable of the goodly pearls. The kingdom of heaven, um, uh, it has many uh, interpretations in today's world, but we stick with the word of God in its interpretation. The kingdom of heaven is where Jesus Christ reigns as king of kings, and the Lord of Lords, and the only potentate. Jesus Christ is the ruler, the king. The church is the manifestation of that kingdom, but it's not the entirety of the kingdom. When the brethren prayed, they prayed for those who are not just here today, or not just part of this church. God has a people in every nation, kindred, tongue, and family. Revelation chapter 7. And that number is so great that no man can number them. That tells me that we don't have the, the privilege, the authority, the wisdom, the understanding to walk down the street and pick out who is and who is not a child of God. God has a great, large family, so great that no man can number them. And God loved every one of them with such a great love that God the Father sent His only begotten and beloved Son in this world to die for them. Can you imagine that? What a magnificent love that is. Those of us who have children, can you imagine offering one of those children for a bona fide sinner? I, 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 I shudder at the thought of it. But God would not require that of man. He didn't of Abraham. But what he would not require of man, God, our Heavenly Father, required of himself. But what does that mean to you and me? What does it mean? There are two contrasts, two extremes that we need to be aware of. There is a hell. Okay? The Bible speaks of it. It is there. 
is called the place of everlasting destruction, where it's perpetual. That is one contrast. The other end of that spectrum is the eternal heaven, the place that Jesus Christ called paradise, the place in which he was speaking of when he said, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. That is an extreme contrast between heaven and hell. So here's the truth of the gospel. Everyone that God the Father gave to Jesus Christ before the foundation of the world, Ephesians 1 and 4, every one of them, Jesus Christ gave his life for and died. And so in John chapter 6, Jesus Christ said, of all that the Father hath given me, he said, the full text says, I came not to do mine own will. But the will of him that has sent me, and this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose what? Nothing. That's a blessed thought, isn't it? Have you ever lost one of your children? Yep, sure have. Sure enough. I drove off one time and thought Jason was in the car and he weren't. Yep, that's happened. But let me tell you something. The God that we've come to worship this morning has never lost a single one. And I mentioned this the other day, and I want to mention it again. There are some that doesn't think that God is concerned about numbers. You've heard that. But let me tell you something, He is. We have five children. That is our household. That's our family. I'm concerned about every one of them. In the mind and purpose of God, what if it were five billion? It couldn't be that because then we could number them. But I assure you that God the Father is concerned about every one of them. And we might be surprised at who some of them are, by the way. You know that Jesus Christ came into this world, and we'll get to our parables in a moment. Jesus Christ came into this world to do something. We must never lose sight of the purpose for which Jesus Christ came into this world. Matthew 1 and 21, we're told that he came into this world to save his people from what? Their sins. So Jesus Christ is part of the triune Godhead. 1 John 5 and 7 says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. So Jesus Christ, when he was conceived in the womb of Mary, was God incarnate into man. He came into this world for a purpose. That purpose was to save his people from their sin. His people are those that were given to him before the foundation of the world, or chosen in him before the foundation of the world, Ephesians 1 and 4. And it was his determination that he would lose not a single one of them. So what did it require of him that he would not lose a single one? It required of him that he would suffer miserably. The depictions of Christ's suffering on the cross are usually the depiction of his physical sufferings. He was beaten with a scourge. A crown of thorns was placed upon his head. He was mocked. He was spat upon. He was slapped. He bore the cross. And he was nailed to the cross. Those are the depictions of the suffering of our Lord. But let me tell you something. On the night before he was crucified, when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he took two of the disciples with him, and went a little farther, and the text tells us that he began to be very sorrowful. Very sorrowful. Now, don't lose sight of your position in that scene. He began to be very sorrowful because he was going to do something that would benefit you. What would benefit you is what, he, what would happen to him the next day on the cross. Surely they crucified him. They nailed him to the cross. 
It was a despicable looking sight. But what made him be very sorrowful is what began to happen at about noon on that day. At about noon on that day, God, his Father, turned out the lights on the whole world. There was a deep darkness that settled upon that scene. All who saw it were amazed. In the midst of that, in the midst of that darkness, something happened to Jesus Christ. Something amazing that God had not experienced. We find what would happen. We'll come back to Matthew 13 in a moment. But we find what happened to Jesus Christ on the cross in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse number 20. Paul says, Now then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. That means conform your life to the word of God. For, watch this carefully now. For he, that is God the Father, hath made him, that is Christ Jesus, to be what? Sin for us. You could never get into heaven being a sinner. Did you know that? Sinners don't make it to heaven. But for the children of God, something had to happen so that you would not be a sinner. What had to happen was that Jesus Christ was made to be sin for you. And the reason that he was, it was necessary for him to bear your sin away from you in the mind and the purpose of God. It was the duty of Jesus Christ to take your sin in his body and take it away from you. Listen to the rest of the text. He says, For he, that is God the Father, hath made him, Christ Jesus, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be, what's the next word? Made the righteousness of God in him. When Jesus Christ was hanging on the cross, he was made to be sin for you, that you might be made the righteousness of God. That means you were made to be righteous because Jesus Christ was made to be sent on your part so that he could bear your sin away. And when God turned out the light on the world, in the midst of that, in that instant, Jesus Christ was made to be sin for you. That is when he cried, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? For a moment, God his Father turned away from him, turned out the light on the world, and in the midst of that, he was made to be sin for you, and he took your sin away. We sing a hymn entitled, It is Finished. What that means is that Jesus Christ finished making you righteous before God the Father. Now, when God the Father looks at you, he looks at you through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. He looks at you as you have no sin. Because Jesus Christ bore it away from you. That doesn't say that we don't sin. John said in 1 John chapter 1, he said, He that saith he hath no sin deceives himself, and the truth is not in him. But when God the Father looks at you, he looks at you through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And the fact that he was made to be sin for you, he bore your sins away. Now, this morning, by the grace and mercy of God, you are fit for heaven. Is that good news? So when he began to be very sorrowful, what he was seeing was the moment that he who knew no sin would be made to be sin for us. Is that good news? That's the reason they call it the gospel. You had to be made to be righteous. And Jesus Christ accomplished it. Now, with that in mind, let's read our two parables. 
beginning in Matthew chapter 13 and verse number 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven. And by the way, he's not just talking about the church. In this case, he's talking about the church being the manifestation of the kingdom. That means that is the part that you can see and behold. But it includes the whole household of God. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure hid in a field. The which when a man hath found, he hideth, and for joy thereof goeth and selleth all that he hath, and buyeth that field. The church, we will say, is like that field. And the man found a treasure in it, and it was so valuable that he went and sold everything that he had to buy that field. Okay, now let's read the next parable. Verse 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is likened to a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, he went and sold, what? All that he had and bought it. In both cases, these men were looking for something. Why would anybody be looking for something in the kingdom of God? It is because, one, they are a child of the Most High God. And number two, they have been born of the Holy Spirit, John chapter 3. They were seeking. They were looking. And both of them found something that was priceless to them. It was a joy to them. When they found it, they were filled with joy. I'm just related to you how it is you became a child of God and what your destiny is. Is that a joy to you? When you think about heaven and what's ahead of you, is that a joy to you? Let me, let me just illustrate the joy of it. There was a man named Stephen. He was a preacher of the gospel. And he was hated for preaching the gospel. And so the authorities took him and they asked him about what he was preaching and bless his heart, he began to preach Jesus Christ with great power. And as they, as he angered his persecutors, they began to rail upon him and right there in the midst of that, this is Acts chapter 8, in the midst of that, the Lord opened up heaven. He just opened it up. By the way, heaven is a place. It's referred to as the place. It is a place. So the Lord opened up heaven to Stephen. Do you remember what he saw? He saw his Lord standing on the right hand of the throne of God. What did that do for him? That filled him with such joy and such vigor that he preached even harder. That filled him with such joy and conviction that as they were stoning him to death, he was praying for them. Can you imagine the scene that he saw in paradise so moved that man that he had no rancor in him, had no anger in him, but he was praying for those who were stoning him. Can you imagine a scene that would do that for you? That would make you pray for mercy, for your greatest enemies. That's what the scene of paradise did for Stephen. Is that worth anything to you? What's it worth to you? Well, in the man that found the treasure in the field, it was worth everything to him. Again, the king of hell in verse 45 is likely to a merchant selling goodly, uh, seeking goodly pearls. He was looking for the best of all pearls. And when he had found uh, one pearl of great price, just one. By the way, there's one truth concerning Jesus Christ. There's a lot of stories of Jesus Christ, but there is only one truth. The truth is that he is the Son of God and verily God. And the truth is 
that he came into this world to save his people from their sins, Matthew 1 and 21. And the truth is that he did exactly what he came to do. For in John 19, verse number 30, as he was hanging on the cross, after he had been made to be sin for everyone that God the Father had given to him, he declared what? It is finished. That is, he had paid your sin debt. He had paid the sin debt of every child of God from Adam to the last one that's conceived into this world. And your home was made secure at that moment. Notice how precious the kingdom of heaven was to these men. They sold everything that they owned. What's going to happen to what we own when we leave this world? What's going to happen to it? We, can, can you take it with you? No. Who's going to get it? What will they do with it? You know, there's things that I have that I've had most of my life that are very precious to me, and I like to get them out, and I, I like to look at it sometimes. But you know what? When I'm gone, it'll probably just be thrown away. I mean nothing to anybody. But you will have something more precious than anything you own in this life. The church, the kingdom of God, preaches a message that reminds us day by day, week by week, of what God has done for us. The treasure hid in the field and the pearl of great price was of such joy that these men sold everything that they had and bought the field and bought the pearl. That reflects a total commitment on their part. You know, so I spent 20 years in the military, and I mean to tell you, they demand, while you're wearing the uniform, brethren, help me, they demand total commitment, do they not? Total. But if... If you've ever been totally committed to anything, it ought to be to the Word of God and to the Kingdom of God. Because it's going to be there with you or you will be there with it even after you leave this world. Is that good news? Now, I'd like to spend the rest of our time in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Now, Remember, the treasure in the field and the good of pearl was so precious that these men sold everything they had. They were totally committed to that which was more precious than anything they had ever previously had. The Apostle Paul begins Colossians chapter 3 this way. If you then be risen with Christ... Now that statement, because of the, of the whole body of the doctrine, does not give you a condition. It's not a condition as to whether or not you've accepted Jesus Christ, nor of whether or not you have obeyed his commandment. But if you be risen with Christ, that is a condition that Jesus Christ met. Okay? Are you with me? Let, let me just address that. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, who did he die for? His people. Everyone that God the Father had given to him. And Jesus Christ said, of all that the Father had given me, I've lost what? Nothing. Well, Paul says, if you be risen with him. Let me, let's illustrate it with the scripture, okay? We, we can, I may not get to the bottom of this story, but that's okay. I want you to just hold your hand right there and go back with me to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I like this passage of Scripture. I've addressed it before, but I like it because it illustrates the point. In 1 Corinthians 15, it's about the resurrection of the dead. Verse number 21, he says, Else what thou shall they do which are baptized for the dead? If the dead rise not at all, why then are they baptized for the dead? You know, there's some wild tales told about that. You know that? There's a philosophy... That you can be baptized for somebody that's already dead, thus save them to heaven. There's, there's a philosophy out there. That is not what the Apostle Paul is teaching at all. In this context, 
Jesus Christ is the one that has died and was buried, right? Okay. Now, when you're baptized, what are you saying? Is baptism just a ceremony? No. What does it mean when you're baptized? Romans chapter 6, the Apostle Paul explains it in great detail. That when a man, a woman, a child is baptized, the minister takes that person in their hands and lays them beneath the water. When I baptize someone, I try to be very careful to get them all the way under the water. Because it is a symbol that needs to be met. Because Jesus Christ died for them, and that person is saying, I believe that Jesus Christ died for me and was placed in the tomb and remained there for three days. But Paul said, but Paul said, Else shall, what shall they do which, uh, which are baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all? So what if the dead doesn't rise? And you go through a baptism. I made this point before, but let me just make it again. So if a preacher is baptizing you and the dead doesn't rise, so where does the baptism end then? It ends with you under the water. That means the preacher's got to baptize you and hold you under that water if there's no resurrection of the dead. Aren't you glad that there's a resurrection of the dead? Because then, all the preacher has to do is just get you under the water and raise you up because you are risen with Christ Jesus. That means when he rose from the dead, that was the surety of one sweet and blessed day, you will rise from the dead. How about that? Do you believe that? Paul said, if you don't believe that, in uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 2, he says, By which, if you believe this gospel by which you are saved, if you keep in memory what I have preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain, and what are we saved from? We're saved from what he said in verse number 19. He says, If in this life only we have hope in Christ Jesus, we are of all men most miserable. He says, If this life is all you're looking forward to, you're a miserable human being. You know why? When I get up off of the bed in the morning, I have to sit there and let myself get collected before I stand up. I've got our little Ella. She's a little sweetheart, a little sweet Pomeranian. She's a darling little dog. I sit in the recliner there, and when I start to get up, I, I call Ella. I said, come help me get up. So sweet little Ella comes just patting over there and she'll stick her little paw out. She's only about that tall. But she'll pick her little paw out uh, to help me get up. Because she knows that Pop groans when he gets up. Getting older, I'll never do the things that I did when I was 20 years old again. I never will. We won't ever crop tobacco anymore, will we, Neon? That, that's, those days are gone. I go outside in this heat in 30 minutes. I'm done. Those things are gone. Well, I won't ever swing out over the big spring on a big rope and drop into the midst of a spring. I won't ever do that again. That's all done. There's a lot of other things that I did that I won't tell you that I won't do again. But all of that is gone, and I'm moving slower, and I'm thinking slower. I'm so tired this morning, I can't hardly stand up. Friday night, I had a wedding rehearsal up at Bethel Church. Uh, yesterday morning, I preached, tried to preach at Palm Chapel in Crestview. And last night, I conducted a wedding up at Bethel. And it was about uh, almost 9 o'clock when I got home. And this morning, I got up. I looked forward to preaching. And I was begging God to give me the strength to preach the gospel to you. Now. This life, if this life, if in this life only we have hope in Christ Jesus, we would be of all men most miserable. I visit folks in nursing homes who can't even get out of the bed. Some that can't even tell you what their name is. What if that was all there was? Is what we have in this life. 
when we're young. Solomon understood that principle. In Ecclesiastes 12, Solomon begins this way. He says, remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth. You know, when I was 20 years old, I could never see the day that I would look the way I look now. I was 24 inches in the waist. My chest was about twice the size of my stomach. My arms were full. I had no wrinkles in my face. I had a full head of curly hair when I was 20 years old. And I could run seven miles and then run in and change my clothes and go back and work all day long. I could do that when I was 20 years old. How many of y'all can do that this morning? Huh? We're getting older. He says, remember now thy creed in the days of thy youth, when the evil days, and I understand the evil days. The joints hurt. Have heart problems. Have lung problems. Have this problem. Have that problem. And the older we get, the more problems we get. Remember now thy creed in the days of thy youth, when the evil days or the bad days come not. And then he gets on down to verse number 7, Ecclesiastes 12 and 7. He says, after we get old and our bodies begin to break down, our organs begin to break down, and our mind begins to quit. Then we get to Ecclesiastes chapter 7. He says, then, that's the end. He says, then this body will return to the dust from which it came. But the Spirit shall return unto the Father who gave it. That's the good news right there. That is that pearl of high price. The truth of that. That's that treasure hid in the field that is more precious than anything else in this life because everything in this life is going away. It's not just your spirit, by the way. When the Scripture records that uh, Jacob's wife, Rachel, died, she had just given birth to Benjamin. And the Scripture says, and when her soul was in departing. You know what the soul means? Everybody's got their own definition of the soul, so let me tell you what mine is. It's life. You know, Jesus Christ tells us, you know, that God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. That means that when your body dies, your spirit don't die, and the soul don't die. You're alive, and when you, you're when the Lord told that thief, today thou shalt be with me in paradise... He didn't say your spirit's going to be hanging in a closet somewhere. What did Stephen see when, when the Lord opened heaven? He saw the Lord, the majesty of the Lord God Almighty, Jesus Christ, uh, standing on the right hand of the throne of God. He could see what was going on there. John, in, in the Revelation epistle, saw those great scenes where there were thousands and thousands, a multitude so great that no man could number, was gathered around that throne, and they were crying such things as, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. There was joy and rejoicing in heaven. That's what's ahead of you. When this life is gone, you're not dead. The spirit, the soul is rejoicing in paradise. But if in this life only we have hope in Christ Jesus, we would be of all men, what? Most miserable. Now, First Thessalonians chapter 3. He says, if you then be risen with Christ. That means if you're a child of God. If you're one that was chosen in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world, if you then be risen with Christ, you're then one that Jesus Christ died for, rose for, and ascended to heaven. You know, I just can't get off of this subject. Let me just ask the question for emphasis. Did Jesus Christ rise from the dead? He did. Did you know that the scripture records that he walked on the face of this earth for 40 days? Many folks, so one time, Paul records in 1 Corinthians 15 that on one occasion, about 500 people saw him at one time. And in Acts chapter 1, on the 40th day after his resurrection, he met the brethren just outside the city. And when he was finished talking with them, do you remember what happened? He began to rise from this earth. Wouldn't you have just loved to be? What if, what if YouTube would have been back then? And Peter just flipped on the YouTube camera and recorded Jesus Christ just rising from the earth. I bet you that would be the most popular video on YouTube. Wouldn't you think so? But it, it was that vivid. 
And they were standing there with their mouths gaped open in awe at what they were seeing. And then an angel stood there beside them. He said, you better count of him. Why stand you gazing up into heaven? For in like manner as you see him going away, what's he going to do? He's coming again. And what's he going to do when he comes again? He's going to come to get you, your body. There's going to be a great resurrection. Of, don't ask me how Paul explained it in 1 Corinthians 15. He compared our resurrection to a seed, and I don't know any more about it than I did when I read it. Can I confess that to you? But I believe it with every fiber that's in me. The body, the soul, will be reunited. That's First Thessalonians chapter 4. And then, He'll just take us off of this earth. And we'll be caught up together with the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. First Thessalonians chapter 4. And then He says, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Let me tell you something. The older I get the more comforting those words become. Because I can see the end from where I am. But you know, it's not really the end. It's just a new beginning for me and for all of the children of God. So Paul said, if you then be risen with Christ, the next word is seek. Like the man that found was seeking and found the, the, the treasure hid in the field, and the other man who found the goodly pearls, those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. So he says, keep, keep your mind focused upon what is after this life. It's been said to me, that is awfully morbid. Well, my response is, it may be morbid, but one day, the mortician is going to entertain you. Is that a dreadful thought? You're not going to care one thing about what they do to your body. Because you will be in paradise. You will be rejoicing around that great throne. Peace, joy, beyond anything that you could possibly imagine awaits you there. Then he says, in verse number two, knowing this to be true, knowing what has been done for you. Let me go back to that a minute, a moment. If somebody were to give you a helping hand in a moment when you were in dreadful trouble, let's just say, let's just say you just had knee replacement. That's something I know something about. You just had knee replacement. And there, and you're on the road and you have a flat tire in the midst of a storm. And you're out so far out that you have no cell phone coverage. You're in trouble. So you said, what am I going to do? And some young 20-year-old comes by and says, sir, ma'am, may I help you? He said, well, I got a flat tire. He throws on a raincoat, jumps out and changes that tire for you. And shakes your hand and takes off. What would you think of that young man? That would be... I remember a story that uh, uh, Katrina told me. She was a... Um, when we homeschooled them in high school, and one of their classes was automobile maintenance, even for girls. And, and uh, the girls ought to know something about that. And I taught them how to change a tire, change the oil, and all that kind of stuff. And so Katrina told me one time that in, in the middle of December in Wisconsin, there was snow on the ground. She was in the parking lot, and, and she came out to her car, and there was a flat tire on there, on the car. So she looked around, and there was guys just driving by in their trucks and their, uh, their sports cars just driving by just looking at her and looking at the flat tire. He says, Dad, I remember what you taught me. I just hopped out there and I changed that tire for myself and I waved at them as they went by as I drove off. Those of you who know trainer, you can see that happening. But the point is, Jesus Christ has done something for you that you could not possibly do for yourself. He saved you from the penalty of your sin. You had no worthiness uh, with which to come before God Almighty 
and require God to save you. You could not do that. You had not sufficient worth it because we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. But what you could not do, God the Father sent His only begotten and beloved Son in this world to do for you. And He finished it. Is that precious? He says, set your affection on things above. Set your affection on the things that Jesus Christ has done for you and how He has blessed you. He says, set your affection on things for you, not on things on the earth. Do you like things on the earth? Do you? Well, let's like bring it back to me. You know, when I'm talking about things like this, I just go ahead and use myself as an analogy because I'm guilty as everybody else. I like my truck. We have a nice car at home, but we drive my truck because I like my truck. How about that? I've been an amateur radio, ham radio operator for 40 years, and I like my ham radio. I really do like that. If somebody wanted to come and would want, if somebody stole my ham radio out of the truck, I would be in a fit because I like that. I like to go deer hunting. I got a few guns at home, and, and I like my guns. I get them out every once in a while. I don't have much time to hunt, but I get them out and I clean them up because I, I like that thing. I like that kind of thing. Not way, I like my wife, too. I, I really do. I've got, got to say that. There are things in this world that we cherish, do we not? But what Jesus Christ has done for us is of such great value that he says, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. You know why? Because the things on this earth are going away. If I died now, probably my son would drive my truck. And I'd hope he'd take good care of it. And probably say would just throw away my ham radios and give the guns away. And no telling who would get that. And so the most important thing is like that pearl of high price. Like that treasure hid in the field. It's worth more than anything that I have. The promises of God. Then he says, For ye are dead. All right, y'all just touch yourself. Are you dead this morning? The text says, For ye are dead. Really? You don't look like you're breathing to me. You're even animated a little bit this morning, which is good. The word dead means to be separated from. You know, when you die, your spirit is separated from the body. That's what it means to be dead. Your spirit is separated from your body. But he says, ye are dead. In the context of this chapter, we'll not get to the bottom of it today because I've only got ten minutes left. He says, but ye are dead. That means you are separated from your sin. You're dead to sin. Paul even says it in the Roman epistle. You're dead to sin means you're separated from it. Because Jesus Christ, the man who knew no sin, was made to be sin for you, that you might be made the righteousness of God in him. Is that good news? You know, I, it was said to me one time, by, there's, a, there's a whole category of Christians out there that believe that they don't sin anymore. Once you accept the Lord in their view, and once you've been baptized in their view, you don't sin anymore. That would be nice, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be nice if you could wake up every day and say, I am not going to sin today. I'm not going to have a bad thought. I'm not going to say anything out of the way. I'm not going to do anything out of the way. I'm going to be a perfect child of God today. We ought to rise with that conviction but how many of us make it before bedtime that night? Paul says, for we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. He says in Romans chapter 7, he says, in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. He calls himself a wretched man, telling the truth. So what is he talking about? He says, set your affection on things of love, not on things of this earth, for you are dead. The good news of the gospel is that you are separated from your sin, and therefore the penalty has been paid for your sin debt, and your home in heaven is secure. He says, for you are hid, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Now, don't let that escape you. Your life is hid. Your body's going to die, but you don't die. At the very instant that your body dies, your spirit, your soul is caught up to heaven, just like the Lord told the thief on the cross, today, you know what they did with his body? Who knows? 
They took that thief's body off the cross. It was dead. They may have just thrown it into their ditch somewhere. But that man, his spirit, his soul, that day was taken to paradise. He knew where he uh, was. He knows where he is today. He's gathered around that throne. He's rejoicing in the presence of the Lord God Almighty this day. Is that good news? So when that last moment comes for us, you've said all the goodbyes, that last moment comes, and the last breath is breathed out, it's the end in this life for that body, but it's not the end for you. Because right then, the soul departs to be with the Lord, and it will be kept there until the day of the resurrection of the dead. Now, so he says, for you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Now, one other point about the word hid there. Have you ever hid anything and forgot where you hid it? I watch the little squirrels out there where they live. They hide acorns. And then they spend hours trying to find the acorn that they hid. They can't remember where they hid it. This word hid in this place means secure. That means Jesus Christ has hid you within himself. Your life is hid with him. He keeps it secure so that nothing can ever separate you uh, between you and the love of your God for you. That's what the latter part of Romans chapter 8 is all about. Verse number 4, he says, When Christ, listen carefully to the phrase, When Christ, who is your life, that means you have life because Jesus Christ is your life. He gave you life and He hides your life. He keeps your life. He secures your life and so that you will never be dead in your soul and spirit. He says, when Christ, who is your life, shall appear. He's going to appear one day. We're taught, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, that one day, and in Acts chapter 1, one day He will appear in the heavens. And you will hear him speak. And this is what he is going to say. He is going to say, Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And let me tell you something. There will be nothing to hold you here. There will be no restraints. You will be taken in your resurrected body to be in that place called eternal heaven. He shall appear, then shall you also appear with him in glory. Then he proceeds. He says, if this is precious to you, this is what you ought to do. You need to mortify, therefore, your members upon this. He says, focus your life, discipline yourself, focus your life upon the church of Jesus Christ, the word of God, and the promises of God. And then he goes down and tells us how to dress. You know, um, let's see if I can remember. Neil, Air Force Regulation 3510, right? That's the dress tells you how to put your uniform on in the Air Force. I believe it is. I got it. That's it. I got it. I got it. That's it. That's a regulation. I don't know what it is for the Marine Corps and the Army. But the Air Force was a good size regulation. And they taught you how to, how to button your buttons. Uh, it, as a matter of fact, I still do this in the morning. Did you know that the tie... In the military, it's got to rest right on the top of your belt buckle. And you'd rather know what a gig line is? Yes, uh, <laughs> I've got a very married too because your the, the line of your shirt fold and the and the top of your zipper's got to be lined up just perfectly. And they do check such things as that. And they, they check to make sure that all your pockets are buttoned. All of those kind of things are specified in your dress in the military. And by the way, you better not have any soil, no dirt, on your uniform in any place when you stand at Spaxum. And so we're familiar then with what he's talking about. He says, put on the new man. The new man that's been created in Christ Jesus, the new man that Jesus Christ has given spiritual life to, put it on so that others can see who you are. We used to wear our uniform proudly because we were thankful to be a part of the military of the United States of America. 
These young men, they put on that uniform. They are proud of who they are, proud of what God has given them in this country. And they wear it proudly because they believe that they're in the service of the God who has given us the liberty that we have in this country. Still to this day, when I conduct a funeral, when I conduct a funeral for a veteran, and by the grace of God, I've had the liberty, I've conducted many of them. When they present the colors, I come to attention and salute that flag in their memory just as I did when I wore that uniform because I am, they are precious to me and what they stood for is precious. And, and, and I, if I could get in my uniform, I'd still put it on once in a while because I am thankful for the country we live in. But we have a Christian uniform to wear. And that Christian uniform is reflect, it reflects our moral behavior, our faithfulness to our Lord, our commitment to Him, and our love for Him. And we ought to live and behave in such a way that people around us can know. Nobody ought to have to ask you, are you a Christian? Did you know that? If somebody has to ask you, are you a Christian, then you've missed the boat. Because we ought to live in such a way that people recognize who we are by our behavior. So he says, put on the new man, which is renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. There's the Matrav. He says, put on, therefore, as the elect of God. I couldn't finish a message like this without dealing with that subject. Did you read that in your Bible? That is in uh, Colossians chapter 3, verse number 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God. Did you know that everybody doesn't serve in the military? And there's some that don't get past day one, too. There's some in about two weeks, they go home. You know that? There's something to do. But those who will commit themselves and will stand for, firm on the principles taught them, they endure, they work hard, and they make it. But in this case, the elect are those who couldn't make it. They are those who didn't have the worthiness to make it. But they have been made worthy by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. You are worthy because he made you worthy. Is that good news? That's the reason they call it the gospel. Is it worth commitment, committing to? Is it worth sacrificing for? Is it worth putting on this uniform and to go about life so that others will have no doubt who your Lord is, who your master is, who your king is? Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercy and kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave, so also do ye. Man, what a tall order is that. Don't get mad with anybody. Don't fuss with anybody. And if somebody does something against you, against you, forgive them. Just summarily forgive them. Let me tell you something. That's hard. Somebody, don't leave me on this limb by myself. That's hard. But that's a commandment. And that is, that's like, that's like the big ribbons we wear on our military uniform. That's like the big U.S. symbols we wear that identifies who we are as children of God. Now, I want to end with this one. In verse number 14. And above all these things, in this precious field, with this precious, this um, priceless um, um, uh, pearl, he says, above all these things, put on charity. Paul makes that phrase, makes that associate twice. Above all things, more than anything else, Put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. Charity, in many places that word is translated love. What it literally means is love that is demonstrated. Walk through life letting people know that you love them. Walk through this life letting people know that you love your God, you love your church, you love your church family, you love your husband, you love your wife, you love your children, you love your parents. Let love be known by the things that you do. As a matter of fact, the Lord 
gave us an illustration, a way that we could demonstrate that. Did you know that? On the night before the Lord was crucified, after the first communion service, the, uh, the apostles were debating among themselves as to which one of them was going to be the greatest in the kingdom. Can you imagine? They were trying to figure out who's going to replace the Lord when he went away, who's going to sit in the high seat, who was going to be in control, who was going to be the heads of state for the various parts of the kingdom. They were trying to figure out all of that. That's when the Lord took his outer garment off and laid it aside. He took a towel then and girded himself. And the King of kings and the Lord of lords knelt down and began to wash his disciples' feet. And then when he was finished, he said to them, Do you know what I've done to you? And there was silence. He says, You call me Master and Lord. And you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet then you also ought, that word ought means indebted, and you also ought to wash one another's feet. That is a symbol of love and con uh, uh, forgiveness, compassion, and that you don't see yourself as bigger or better than anybody else in the room. That's what that's all about. Can you imagine an environment where we all behave that way? Kind and loving and forgiving to each other. That's like a treasure hidden in a field. Like a pearl of high price. Remember those men sold all that they had and they went and purchased it because it was the most precious thing in the world to you. I want to leave you with this question. What is the most precious thing to you in this life. May God bless you, my prayer.